Hello out there, Radio Land. This is Michael. This is the Street Preacher's Corner Podcast, the podcast where we refuse to belong to any club that has standard solo they would have us as a member. Well, we here we are on uh, lesson something of Mark. I'm not sure. Uh, I took one and, and, and split up into two, and that kind of threw my number and system off. And so we're going to truck on ahead uh, with, uh, we're still in Mark chapter one. And for those of you that are listening, you know, all two of you, uh, thanks for re- keeping up with us along so far. And for those of you that aren't, well, you don't, you won't hear me saying this. It has always intrigued me when pastors will preach uh, a sermon uh, to people that are at church about why they should be in, be, be in church. Anyway, um, so we're in we're Mark, verse, uh, Mark chapter 1, and we're in, we are in verse 12. Now, I, I, I'm going to, man, I'm going to chase some rabbits. It's okay, though. Verse 12 says, and immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. Now, um, we have to talk about this word immediately, because this word immediately, as it turns out, is pretty important, and it was the source of a great... Um, I would say a great crisis of faith, um, but it was, it was, it was a, it was a. The word immediately was the source of great concern to me. Now, let me back up a little bit from that. So, so when when you're reading your Bible, um, and if you're just reading and just blowing through it, and you're not thinking about what you're reading, uh, you will, you'll, you, you probably won't even. This what I'm talking about will probably never happen to you. But if you're studying your Bible and you're laying verse upon verse and line upon line and precept upon precept and comparing things spiritual, things spiritual and comparing scripture with scripture, you eventually will find a situation where you don't you see something that doesn't seem to quite jive up. And um, when that happens, you, you you know. God is not afraid of your questions and God is not afraid of your scrutiny. And so if you find something in the Bible that seems like it doesn't jive, I don't think you should just stick your fingers in your ear and go, la, 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 and call that faith. That's not faith. I got a whole message I'm going to do one of these days about what faith is and what faith is not. But suffice to say, that the blind faith that people, uh, the scoffers seem to think that re- quote unquote religious people have, the, the, the faith that's based on nothing other than I choose to believe this, that's not biblical faith. Biblical faith is always based on something solid. It's always, it always uh, has substance to it. So when you're reading through your Bible and you find something that you can't make jive, uh, the solution is not to go la, 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 and pretend it's not there. The solution is to dig and dig and dig and dig. And at the end of the day, uh, if, if, if I would take, if, if I were to take every time um, that, um, that I found something in the Bible that didn't quite jive, I won't say that I've always found a clear and present solution. I won't say that I've always found this really, oh, well, that's what that verse means. Okay. Sometimes you got to go through your Bible. Sometimes you got to pray. Sometimes you got to fast. Sometimes it takes years. But what I haven't found is an actual contradiction in the Bible. There's some passages I don't know what they mean. There's some passages I don't know what they under, I don't understand how they fit together. Other passages, but I've never yet found a contradiction in the Bible. And I've talked to plenty of people who their 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 go to argument is. You can't believe the Bible because it has all these contradictions. So when you talk to these people, you say, can you show me one? Uh, what they'll usually do nowadays is they'll pull up some website where some other guy has compiled some list that he got some, some other guy. And what I really want someone to do is I want someone to sit down with me and show me something that they found themselves. And show me how they went through every possible explanation and they prayed, and they fasted, and they waited for God's answer. And at the end of the day, the answer was, the Bible has a contradiction in it. I say, Michael, why are you saying all this? Because I found myself in a position, I don't even know how many years ago this was. With, with, with this verse here, Mark 1, uh, verse 12, and and the, the, the uh, corresponding passages in other Gospels, it did not look to me like they lined up. It looked to me like there was one place was saying one thing, and one place is saying enough. So we're going to look at all that, and I'm going to tell. I'm going to. I'm going to take you through. We may not get a whole lot done this time, but I'm going to take you through my personal walk through this verse and the corresponding passages, so you can know that a. I'm actually doing the legwork here. I'm not just 
you know, downloading stuff off the internet and regurgitating it. Although that, I guess that's, you know, somewhat legitimate. But I'm actually doing the legwork, and I want to. I want you to have confidence that the book that you have in your lap, or the book that you have in your whatever, um, your English Bible can be trusted. Not only can it be trusted in like the big stuff, like did Noah's Ark really happen, but it can be trusted in individual words on an individual page. Every word that's there is supposed to be there. Before we get the word immediately, well, let's just say this. As always, there's a reason you have four Gospels as, as opposed to one. We have to look at the other accounts of this same event here in, uh, in Mark ch- chapter 1 to get everything that God wants us to have. But, 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 but let me scratch this other itch for just a second, and i got to look at the word dry with. The verse says, uh, verse uh, 12, and immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. Now, I have heard in my church travels this odd, this odd phenomenon. There's a couple of uh, there's a couple of sermons that I've heard from different men who don't know each other, and it is the exact same sermon, the same illustrations. And I don't know where they're all getting it from, um, but I've heard from uh, in my church travels. I've heard the exact same sermon preached by different men out of the exact same text, and the sermon always has a title like "Leading versus Driving." And the, the, the text they use, uh, and, and some of these men are my friends, and I've scratched my head and said, come on, you can do better. Um, the text they use, because what you, you, you get, the text they use is Genesis 33. So, so I know we're in Mark 1, but run over to Genesis 33, because apparently I'm allergic to staying in the same place. Jacob, uh, in Genesis 33, Jacob is on the run from Esau, or he's been on the run from Esau for some time now. Now he's coming back to the old homestead, back to the old home country, with his wife and his kids and his and his uh, his his cattle in in tow, and uh, and so there's that. So what happens here uh, is that uh, we're going to go to verse uh, 33. I'm sorry, chapter 33 of Genesis, verse 13. This is this is Esau, this is Jacob and Esau <laughs> speaking to each other. This is uh, actually Jacob speaking here in verse thirteen. And he said to them, unto him, My Lord knoweth that the children are tender, and the flocks and herds with young are with me, and if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. Okay? Uh, and let my Lord I pray thee pass over before a servant, and I will lead on softly according as the cattle that goeth before me, and the children be able to endure until I come uh, to my, unto my Lord, unto Sayer. Now, laying aside the fact that Jacob never made it to Sayer, because at the end of the day, Jacob never stopped being a little bit of a character, a little bit of a shady character, a little bit of a liar. Um, but the, so, so men will look at these verses, and the way Jacob uses them right here, and they will say, lead and drive are, are antonyms, and, and the, you know, the words are opposite, and thank you, English class. And I, I get you could, I, okay, I get you could get that from the text. Uh, although I think the, the key words there are over, as in overdrive and, and softly. Uh, you, you know, you, I've heard guys say you drive cattle, but you lead sheep. Okay, okay, I get what you're saying. You're saying that, you know, some of us are caustic and some of us are mean and some of us are forceful. And we ought not be that way because after all, if we do that, we'll kill our women and we'll kill our children because we'll drive them. What we should be doing is leading them because driving and leading is not the same thing. You lead your family. You don't drive them. If you drive women and children, they die. This is what this is what the, the core message of every message I've heard about this thing. And they always go to the same verse. It's very strange. It's like it's like they're getting this message uh, off of a forum somewhere and just preaching. It. And, and, and I know the men that are doing it and they're, that's, they're, done, they're not inclined to that. See, the Holy Spirit is really behind that or well, I don't I don't know. The other, the other sermon that I've heard over and over and over again is this, this uh, uh, towards the end of the New Testament uh, where Christ appears to the disciples after, the, after his resurrection. He's talking to Peter, and he says, you know, Peter, do you love me more than these? And he says, Peter, do you love me more than these? And he says it three times, and this entire argument is built that there's two different kinds of love there. There's agape love and there's filial love, and that, and that, and that when... When when uh, when Peter responds to Jesus, he doesn't use agape love; he uses filial love, and we should have filial or we should have agape love for God and feel all this, all this, and they go into all this Greek stuff. 
And the problem with this, that whole argument is, uh, well, there's lots of problems with it. But one of the problems is the only place in the Bible where you see that back and forth where it's agape and filio, agape and filio, agape and filio, is in that passage. And second of all, I don't care what the Greek says. But agape filio, agape filio, and they act like agape and filio are these two different, very different types of love. And that Jesus is making the point to Peter that he should love, uh, the, he, that Peter should love Jesus more than he does. Well, we should all love Jesus more than we should. But but the fact is, if you go through the rest of the New Testament, if you were just so inclined, and you would look at every time that agape and filio are used, they are used interchangeably over and over and over again. Yes, I have chased a rabbit who had his own rabbit who gave birth to another rabbit. Now we got to circle back around to where we started. Actually, one step behind where we started. We got to go over here. We got to talk about leading and driving and how they're not antonyms. And I will prove to you uh, that they were an, an, they're not antonyms. Okay, so so in one hand, uh, grab uh, run back to math, uh, Mark, Mark chapter one. I think I can make a pretty good case very very easily that leading and driving are not antonyms. You can overdrive someone, and you can lead someone softly. And those are antonyms, but drive and lead by themselves are not antonyms. Okay, so Mark 1, verse 12, and immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. So the Holy Spirit drove Jesus Christ into the wilderness. Okay, Matthew 4. Matthew 4, and it says, uh, verse 1 of Matthew 4, then Jesus, then was Jesus led <clears throat> above the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So, in one place he's driven, in one piece, place he's led. <clears throat> and if led and driven are two entirely different things, then you have a you have an issue. You got to deal with it, unless they're not entirely two different things, unless they're the same thing. But just to just to drive the nail in the coffin even more, let's look at the third account of this in the in the book of Luke. You say, Mike, this stuff doesn't matter. This stuff matters. Every little thing matters. Everything is important in such matters. Luke chapter 4. The Bible do say. Verse. I'm doing this in deteriorating light conditions. So I'm, I'm, I'm scrambling here. Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So, votes are two for leading and one for driving. And I submit to you, based on that alone, leading and driving are not antonyms. They are synonyms. The Holy Spirit's the one doing both of them. Jesus is the one receiving both of them. And those two words are used interchangeably. So, there you go. So, next time somebody somebody preaches about how you should lead your wife and drive your children or lead your, you know, what, what, what I, I don't know who you should... I, it, if leading and driving are two different things, you're supposed to lead your family, not drive them. Then who are you supposed to be driving? So there you go. That, that scratched that itch. Okay, now, um, you know, so 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 you, so on behalf of, um, let me phrase this correctly. So on behalf of alpha males everywhere, let me let me let me let me sort this out. Okay, uh, you are supposed to drive your family, but not overdrive them because drive at least sometimes, means lead. Or take, as in, I drove him to school. You see? See? It's not that complicated. And I'm sorry if that if you're one of the guys that preached that and I just destroyed your notes. Yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll get over it. There's, there's plenty of stuff in the Bible to preach. You don't, you, don't need to, you don't need to recycle the same nonsense over and over again. All right, back to Mark chapter 1. So, so before we overdrive, <laughs> see, see, see what I did there? On the word immediately, which is where we start out, let's let's uh let's overlead on the word wilderness, okay? So wilderness has a definition. It says it says there uh, that immediately the spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And so wilderness has a definition. I mean, I'm sitting here on this undisclosed location in rapidly de uh, deteriorating light conditions, and and um and I'm surrounded by what an American would call wilderness. I can see trees in every direction, I think, just about. And, uh, but, but that, that's, that's the word we use, wilderness. We say, oh, but so it isn't necessarily a forest. It's, it, 
when the Bible says a wilderness, it's it's a it has a definition that as being a wild place. It's a place where nobody lives, and it is used that way um, over a hundred times in your Old Testament. Even a place to, to pick up pick up Isaiah sixty four. Stick your finger in Mark one. We're going to go back to it. Look at Isaiah sixty four. So the thing that makes something a wilderness is not necessarily that there's trees there. The thing that makes something a wilderness is the fact that people aren't there. So you can have a place that has even has infrastructure, uh, like you know houses and wells and whatever, and it be, it can be considered a wilderness. It's if if it's abandoned. Look at Isaiah sixty four. Verse uh, 10. Let's back up. Hold on. Uh, verse 9. Be not wroth very sore, O Lord, neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee, we are all thy people. Thy holy cities are a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. <laughs> so if you abandon a place, technically that, that, that fits the definition of being a wilderness. Um, uh, Wilderness also in your Bible has a geographical definition. It is the is the area um, east of the Jordan River. It's it's a vast area that sort of stretches from the Red Sea around the bottom of the Dead Sea, and then you you know you go up there and you hang a left and you head towards Jordan. That entire area is called the wilderness because it says the children of Israel wander around the wilderness for forty years. Well, if you look at where they are wandering, you say, okay, that place is is the wilderness. And uh, so John's on the on the you know John for example John in uh, in in, in the first chapter one is on the bank of the Jordan, baptizing in the wilderness. And after Jesus gets baptized, Jesus goes even further east, away from everybody, quote into the wilderness. Now so um so now that we've you know overdrived or overdwelt or overdriven the definition of drive and lead in wilderness. Uh, let's talk about the word immediately. Now, let me, let me, let me, let me back up here a little bit. So, so here's the mental image I had when I first started reading my Bible. Um, you know, Christ comes down to the river Jordan, John baptizes him and puts him under the water. He comes up out of the water. The spirit of God descends upon him like a dove. And because it says immediately, I thought Jesus Christ walked straight out of the, gar- the Jordan river, clothes still driven wet and headed, headed into the wilderness. Because when I say immediately, that's what I mean. I mean, it happens, you know, right right now, right now. And so, so that's fine. That's fine. Except, except. Okay, so one of, my, one of my core beliefs is that the Bible that I have in my hand is perfect and it's infallible and it's inspired. It didn't used to be inspired. It still is inspired. I think the words on the page are the right words and there is no need to run back to a language that or, or, or an original that nobody has uh, uh, or nobody has seen uh, or, or there's no reason to consult a language that I don't speak. Uh, hopefully that explains why I zero in on what, what words mean, uh, you know, in, 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 in the English. Um, but why am I going through all this? Because for years, like I said, I looked at that situation in verse 12 and I thought Jesus was dripping wet and headed off into the, into the wilderness. And the whole story is a lot more complicated. So let's define immediately. Okay. I'll show you me. Well, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. Well, there's, there's a couple of ways I, I can approach this. So let's define the word immediately. Webster's 1828. I think you should find a, a dictionary that is reliable and reflects biblical language uh, before the modern definitions got slapped on things. And for me, it's 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 the 1828 edition of Webster's. It's not the Bible, but a lot of times it will give you the verse that they drew this definition from using the context of the verse. Great stuff. Um, so Webster's 20, 1828 defines immediately as an adverb. It says, without the intervention of any other cause or event opposed to immediately by means of a secondary cause. Now, now it is, you know, it is fascinating to me um, how words drop out of a language. Words drop out of English. And you'll have words in the English language that don't have an opposite anymore. The opposite word um, is gone. We just nobody. For example, the word superstition. It would be above stition, right? I mean, that's just, that's what super, superman is above men, super tornado, super, super power ball, or that's also higher, higher, higher. So we don't have a word for stition. But we have a word for superstition. We have a word for we have a word called innocent. Innocence. I N N O C E N T. And there used to be an English word called nocent. And nocent meant guilty. 
So the same way that incredible meant not credible, uh, uh, innocent means not guilty because innocent meant guilty. So, like, okay, Mike, I get it. You're 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 a geek. I get it. Okay, now listen, listen, just just bear with me. Okay, so you have this word immediately, and immediately used to have a word that went along with it called immediately. Mediate is the is the root word. Same, they have a common root word. And so to mediate is to is to is to is to negotiate something and and you know massage it and and, and like when you go into a contract mediation or you go into some kind of some kind of mediation of a dispute. Well, we used to have a word used to mediate. Mediate what meant to 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 to, to uh, that something that something was affected by a secondary cause. Okay, so mediate. I'm sorry, immediately means without mediation. So without a secondary cause. All right. So let's let's let okay. Let's say. Let's, let's bring this down where, uh, where you can actually get your brain around it, okay? So let's say you decide in the morning that you need to go to the grocery store. Now, if nothing else happens to change that, your trip to the grocery store is immediate in nature, even if you don't get there till the afternoon. So what, what, why does that matter, Mike? Because we got to look at all the verses, okay? Look at John 1. As it turns out, Jesus did not get up dripping wet out of the Jordan River and immediately walk off into the forest. As it turns out, the timeline's a little more going on than that. Like, ah, okay, okay, Mike, what the word are you talking about? Okay, so John 1, verse 26. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom you know not. He it is. So when John says this, Jesus is standing there, right? There's one that standeth among you, whom you know not. Now, John did not know who that man was until after he had baptized Jesus. So this this, this statement, verse 26, happens after Christ comes out of the water, okay? Uh, he it is that cometh after me, is preferred before me, whose shoes lights I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, Okay, so John, so Jesus has been baptized, and at some time after that, John says, "There's one standing here among you, is preferred before me." The next day, G, uh, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, "Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world." This is he of whom I said, "After me cometh the man which is preferred before me, for is before me." And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, uh, the same as he which baptized with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bare record that this is the Son of God. Again the next day, after John stood and to his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, he said Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Okay, so, and it goes on from there. So, so here's the timeline. John is baptizing. Jesus shows up. He's baptized. The dove descends. All that stuff happens. Jesus comes back the next day. According to verse 29, John declares him to be the Lamb of God. Jesus comes back one more time, verse 36, kind of like a, you know, a little drive-by thing. And John declares it again, and Jesus leaves for the wilderness. So he didn't get out of Jordan and walk dripping wet into the, into the wilderness. He walked into the wilderness at least two, three days after his baptism. But because that was what his original intention was to do, and nothing else changed happened uh, to change that, his trip to the wilderness was immediate. You see what I mean, Jellybean? So here was my crisis. I read Mark 1, saw he immediately went to the wilderness. I read John 1, said he hung around for a couple of days. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. And I went to a guy um, who, you know, we used to be friends. I don't know that we're friends anymore, but he, he was a guy that I had a lot of confidence in. And I said, what about this? You ran into this. And he goes, and he said, no, I never, I never thought about that. I mean, I don't know what to do with that. 
And so here I am. I got to stand on my own two feet. Can't lean on his Bible knowledge. I got to lean on my own. And so I dug and I dug and I dug. And I found out that the word immediately does not mean what I thought it meant. And so there you go. You can leave the text as it stands. You don't have to correct it. You don't have to explain it, although technically I did spend the last 25 minutes explaining it. But the, the, the Bible you have in your hand, you can trust. And oh my goodness, that is a blessing beyond measure. All we've covered, this is lesson, I don't know, three, four, five, something like that. We are not even 12 verses into the book of Mark. And we've talked for hours already. And that's that's probably not, uh, yeah. So what we, what, we, what do we do? We have 25 minutes in this thing. We've covered one verse. We've defined uh, three words, and we've dealt with a supposed Bible contradiction. And we're just flying through it, aren't we? Well, folks, I think I'm going to shut it down right there because the next uh, section that we get into uh, involves the baptism of, of uh, our Jesus going to the wilderness. There's some stuff in there that I don't know that I understand, and I'm trying to get this done in a halfway timely manner. I've got these, you know, I've got these notes uh, uh, from previous uh, verse by verse studies to this. But I tell you, man, every time you go through this thing, you see something else, and then that door opens other doors, and that question raises other questions, and pretty soon you're way over here, and you know, you know, you've gone from being in left field, you're out behind the scoreboard, to you're out in the parking lot, to you're back at the house eating a hot dog, all in chasing something. Every door opens another door. So, um, so as I'm going through Mark again in preparation for this this little podcast thing, what I'm finding is there's some stuff that I thought I understood that I don't, and stuff that I dig a little bit deeper, and and, and I come up kind of kind of scratching my head and I'm doing this in real time. You know, I'm doing this. Uh, I mean, I, I, I've, I've got the next three or four lessons sort of, sort of sketched out as how, how we're going to do it. But, but, but I have to be honest with y'all and say, we're fixing to get into some territory where I don't understand the significance of things. Maybe sometimes I don't understand. Uh, and I looked at what other men have said and, and, and sometimes that's helpful and sometimes that's not. But, um, Maybe if we're all patient with each other, and maybe if I just go as slow as I need to, and if I got to define every word in a sentence, I'll define every word in a sentence, and we'll run all the cross references, and we'll talk about what Psalm ninety-one means, which is where I'm stuck at right now, and uh, and we'll get through it, and it'll be it'll be good and it'll be helpful. Hopefully, everybody's enjoying this stuff. Um, I'm having a blast because I like teaching the Bible. Uh, I don't necessarily like podcasting, but I do like teaching the Bible. Anyway, I've rambled on long enough. I said what I was going to say. I need to get on out of here. Uh, those of you that are listening, thank you very much. Um, and I guess I will see you on the other side.